Greetings, everyone. This is Steve White, and I want to welcome you to my presentation, Helping Black Children Reach Their Full Potential, The Seven Keys to Developing the Genius Inherent in All Black Children. So I know that there is so much going on in the world today. I understand, you know, how important your time is, and I know with everything going on with the virus, that that's causing a lot of stress and everything else. But, you know, we're going to get through the virus. So I want you to just relax and just soak in this information that we're going to present to you today. And for those of you who are serious about helping Black children reach their full potential, I think you're going to find that this information is really going to be inspirational, motivational, and very informative to help you to uh, do just that. <clears throat> you know, it's said that if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And so I'm saying that the genius potential that's lying dormant in black children must be brought forth in order for them to save themselves and order, in order for us to help save them as well. So to go a little further, I wrote this a few days ago. It says that unless black children are given the educational foundation necessary to reach their full potential, they will be stuck in a perpetual cycle of mental and physical slavery. And this is real, this is very, very real. So the work that we're doing here today and the work that you all have embarked on as educators is all about helping to save the lives of black children. Now, I'm gonna move fast, I'm gonna move quickly, like I said, because I don't wanna hold you uh, for a long, long time again, because I do value your time. But I want you to just take a look at this little comic strip because it also helps to set the foundation for where we're going with this presentation. As you can see, it's a little boy. Uh, basically, his father is telling him that your teacher said you seem to have trouble concentrating in class. And he said, no, that's not true. I just have trouble concentrating on whatever she's talking about. So I found it very interesting when I came across this comic strip because one of the things that we want to do in this presentation is we're not pointing the finger at the student today. We're not pointing the finger at the parent today. We're talking about what you can do as an educator to help black children reach their full potential. So just like you're seeing in this case here, the onus is not on the child because he's saying, no, I don't have a problem concentrating, even though the fact that the teacher thinks I have a problem concentrating may lead to the child being labeled and the child being um, thought of as having some kind of deficit, when in fact what the child is saying, no, if anything, the deficit is on the teacher because I don't have a problem concentrating. I just have, a, I just have trouble concentrating on whatever she's talking about. Real quickly, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I uh, started doing this work back in 1990, uh, working as an educational consultant as, and trainer. And for the past 30 years, the focus of my work as an educational consultant and trainer has been the positive development of the black family. In 2004, we started a book publishing company that really grew out of the fact that I wanted to publish my own book and that really led to me starting to do work for others. And so now we have a full service book publishing company that's now going into, or into its 16th year of existence. And we've helped a lot of authors become published authors. I also have a mentoring program that I started back in 1993 that is still going strong to this very day, uh, entitled From Black Boy to Black Man. It's a nationally recognized mentoring program. Actually, in 2014, I was named the National Mentor of the Year by 100 Black Men of America, which is the largest black mentoring organization in the country. And so I'm very proud of that fact. We also have a prison reentry program where I go into prisons and work with men that are incarcerated and help prepare them for a successful reentry, focusing on their mental, spiritual, physical, and economic development so that they can come home and be good husbands, good fathers, good sons, and, and just be successful contributors to the, their communities and to society as a whole. So I really enjoy that work. I really enjoy the work with the uh, men that are incarcerated or behind the wall, if you will. And then just recently, we started offering some communication coaching, because even if you look at the comic strip, just think back to that again, what is really being said is that 
the teachers need to be more effective in their communications to hold that child's attention or to hold his concentration because it's, it's, it's true, as he's saying, I don't have a concentration problem. I just have a problem concentrating on, on what the teacher is talking about. And so we offer communication coaching for people who are in business or in education, uh, for authors, et cetera, helping them if they want to do keynote speeches, if they want to conduct seminars and workshops, if they want to conduct board meetings, uh, if they need sales training, uh, again, being more effective in the classroom as a communicator. So that's something very new to what we offer under the arm of Protect the Hands Communications. And so again, just, just to show that I was named one of South Florida's top black educators in 2018. 2018, I was also honored, one of five people honored by the Tom Joyner Foundation. And we received the key to the city from Riviera Beach, which is the city that I live in, the city that I was born and raised in. And, you know, I, I mentioned receiving the key to the city from Riviera Beach, Florida, because, you know, it's very hard sometimes to get recognized by the very city in which you were born and raised and lived in. So often it seems we have to move away before our work is recognized. So I'm very thankful for that. Also thankful for the fact that we received seven silver medals from the Florida Authors and Publishers Association for our book publishing work as well. So I just tell you a little bit about myself. One, to say that yes, I do have some credibility, but more importantly, to say that I really strive to be someone who not only just talks the talk, but actually strives very, very hard to walk the walk, okay? To, as the people will say, to practice what I preach. And these are the two books that I've written that I was just telling you about, Helping Black Children Reach Their Full Potential. And the other one is a workbook for my mentoring program. This is actually the curriculum for the mentoring program. Uh, one of the reasons why our mentoring program is successful is that we utilize a curriculum that was designed specifically for black males. We're not borrowing from somebody else's curriculum. And so uh, we think that that really helps to make it successful. So now, what's the objective of this presentation? The objective of this presentation is very simple. It's to inform you and to inspire you and increase your understanding of what you can do to help black children reach their full potential. As I said, or as I'm saying now, the objective of this workshop is not to change the educational system. Okay, that's a totally different workshop. This is about your personal development your personal responsibility and your personal commitment to properly educate black children. So the question that I pose to you is very simple. Are you willing? Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Are you willing to strengthen your commitment to educating black children, to properly educating black children so that they can reach their full potential? Now, I want to take this time to really examine the title. This title was given to me through inspiration when I was working on this workshop years ago in the title, Helping Black Children Reach Their Full Potential, The Seven Keys to Developing the Genius Inherent in All Black Children. So it's a long title, but it's a title that has to be dissected and understand the power behind the title and the power behind the objective of this presentation. So I looked up the definition of the word genius. And it says that it is an exceptional natural capacity of intellect, especially as shown in creative and original work in science, art, music, etc. So it's an exceptional natural capacity of intellect. And then I looked up the word inherent. And the definition for inherent is existing in someone or something as a permanent and inseparable element, quality, or attribute. So look at this now. So we use the word genius, a word that's thrown around quite a bit. It says it is an exceptional, natural capacity of intellect. And then inherent is existing in someone or something as a permanent and inseparable element. So what are we saying here? We're saying that Black children have an exceptional, natural capacity of intellect. It is exceptional. And we're saying that it is existing in these Black children, in Black children, as a permanent and inseparable element, quality, or attribute. So it's an exceptional natural capacity, and it is a permanent 
an inseparable element. So it's there, it's there. Black children have this genius potential. Now, what then is your role? Your role is that of an educator, not as a teacher, because we don't need more teachers, we need educators, because you know, you can be a teacher and teach the wrong information, teach people to do things the wrong way, but you still taught them, you just taught them incorrectly. We need educators, why? Because the root meaning of the word educate is educe, which means to bring out or develop that which is latent or lying dormant. So now when you tie all of this together, you understand exactly what your role is. Your role as an educator is to bring out the natural capacity of intellect, the exceptional natural capacity of intellect that is in black children that is a permanent and inseparable element, quality, or attribute. It's there. Your job is to bring it forth. So by accepting this job, by stepping into the educational arena in whatever capacity you're in this job, teacher, or I'm sorry, educator, so whether you're in the classroom, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a college student soon to go into the classroom, whatever capacity you are operating in, if you're in the field of education, then you've taken on a divine assignment. You have been assigned the responsibility, the privilege, and the honor. And this really is how we need to see it. If, if this is just a job for you, you're doing the wrong thing. But if you understand that you have a divine responsibility, privilege, and honor of nurturing and cultivating Black children, so that they may reach their full potential. And when you accepted the responsibility by taking on this role, you do not have permission to fail. You must succeed at what you're doing because you're talking about the lives of black children that have been placed in your hands. And I want to stress to this that the children, the children of the people who contributed the most to advance this world, are now treated as expendable, but they're not. Although people seem to think they are. And why do I say that? Because if black, if any other group of people, any other group of children were being treated the way that black children are being treated in the school system, I believe there would be a national emergency, literally. You know, there's a national emergency, a national panic going on right now with this coronavirus. People are taking all kinds of measures to eradicate this virus so that they can get back to some form of normalcy. Everybody is on edge and on alert, doing whatever they can because there's a virus that has so far as of today, I think what close to 100,000 people, maybe they say uh, have, have died from the virus. But millions of black children are destroyed through an educational system that miseducates them year in and year out, generation after generation, and nobody sounds the alarm. So the only thing I can assume then is that the belief is that these children are expendable, that we can do without them, that we can watch them die a mental, spiritual, and physical death and continue just to move on. Not so. So, you are an educator. Whether you are in a virtual or physical classroom, there are creative and innovative things you can do to help black children reach their full potential. Their home life is no excuse. Don't blame the parents, that's a whole nother workshop. I do this same workshop for parents. When I talk to parents about what their responsibilities are as parents to help their children reach their full potential. This presentation is geared towards educators to talk about what your responsibilities are as educators to help black children reach their full potential. So again, their home life is no excuse. You must give 100% effort in the classroom because that's all you can do. You can't control what goes on in the home. You give 100% effort in the classroom, in the school, in whatever capacity. Don't let their, the appearance of black children, how they talk, how they dress, how they look, who their siblings are or who their parents are, don't let any of that influence your expectations for the child that's in front of you. And don't let that 
stop you from giving your 100% effort because none of these factors has anything to do with their intellectual potential. And the other thing I want, that's a very important point, don't equate knowledge with intellectual ability or potential. And I've mentioned this show, Jeopardy. I put it in parentheses just to talk about that because most of us have seen the television show Jeopardy and at some point over the years, right? And we think of Jeopardy as being the show, you know, you have to be smart, you have to be intelligent to compete on Jeopardy because Je Jeopardy measures your intelligence. But actually what Jeopardy measures is your knowledge not your intellectual ability or potential, but your knowledge. And so Jeopardy, and, and this is an important point, Jeopardy is a show that is based on a Eurocentric approach as far as the knowledge and the questions that, that they pose or the information that they focus on. It's, it's from a Eurocentric perspective. And so what happens is you have people who come on there, primarily white people, who are very knowledgeable of Eurocentric information. And so black people are rarely seen on Jeopardy and it's not because they lack intellectual ability, but perhaps they just aren't as well versed in Eurocentric information or knowledge. If you were to set up a game show that was Afrocentric in its approach, then you would have a set of people who would do very well and then you would have another set of people who, the same people perhaps, who could do very well on Jeopardy that would not do very well in an Afrocentric Jeopardy, if you will. And it's simply because their knowledge is being measured, not their intellectual ability. If I get on a plane as a passenger, I'm very knowledgeable of what I should do as a passenger. Where does, you know, check in, sit down, wait for the little half a soda to come down the aisle, buckle your seat belts, et cetera. If you take me into the cockpit where the pilot is, I have no knowledge of what the pilot should do or what needs to happen in order to fly the plane. That has nothing to do with my intellectual ability. It just means that I don't, I'm not knowledgeable in that area, but I could be if I took the time to learn. So don't think that because black children may not be knowledgeable in certain areas that that has anything to do with their intellectual ability or potential. Lastly, I want to say once again, you are educators. Stop seeing yourself as a teacher, but seeing yourself as someone who's going to bring forth this genius potential that is lying dormant in the children and the black children that are seated in front of you every day, whether virtually or in the physical classroom. So when you change how you see yourself, your attitude and your approach to the educational process will also change because you will understand that your role, that you have children in front of you who have the intellectual capacity, you are just going to bring it forth. You're going to bring it out. It's lying dormant and you're going to bring it forth. Your whole perspective should change in how you approach children. The other thing I want to talk about is the danger, the danger of stereotypes. Because one of the things that happens to teachers and one of the things that happen to black children is that both of them become victimized by negative stereotypes. Because again, as you see, a lot of what I want to focus on, if, you know, and not just to talk about technique, but really your approach, your attitude to, towards educating black children. Because if you know all of the techniques to employ in the classroom, but your heart is not in it, your commitment is not where it should be, then it doesn't matter if you know technique. It's like the doctor who is a great surgeon or a great therapist or great in whatever capacity he operates as a doctor, but he's focused more on making money than he is on healing the people. So it doesn't matter that he's a great surgeon because he's gonna prescribe surgery when it's not necessary and maybe withhold surgery when it is because everything for him is generated or guided by his desire to make money, not to necessarily heal. So for you to know different techniques that you can employ in the classroom, that's not the focus because if you're not really committed to these children, to doing everything that you possibly can to help them reach their full potential, technique goes for naught. But most importantly, if you really are committed to helping black children reach their full potential, 
then the techniques that you use, you will have the understanding and therefore you will know what you need to do in the classroom to help them reach their full potential based on the fact that you're committed to doing whatever it takes to get them there. Okay, so stereotypes are very dangerous because the most dangerous thing about a negative stereotype is when the people who are stereotyped start to believe the stereotypes themselves. So black children are good at sports. That's fine, except that when black children start to believe that that's basically where they excel, where, where they excel, and the teachers and others who are around them think that, okay, this is where their strengths are, they're good at sports, but they don't think about them being good intellectually, then that becomes a problem. Black children are loud and overly active. That becomes a problem because they start to believe that themselves and they start to act accordingly. Black children aren't smart and can't learn. Once again, teachers have some of these beliefs and the black students have these beliefs about themselves. This is what led to that whole syndrome of saying that when you're smart, you're acting white because they think that that's not the arena in which they are supposed to perform in. But they don't say you're acting white when they excel in sports or when they excel in music. But all of a sudden, when it comes to intellectual or academics, then all of a sudden, if you're showing uh, achievement there, you're acting white because of these stereotypes that they have. Black children are ghetto, whatever that means. Somebody define what is ghetto, but it always has negative connotations. And black children will sometimes say that about themselves. Black children don't speak well, again, based on who's doing the judging as to what is good speech. Black children are good dancers and rappers. Black children are highly sexed. You know, you, this, this may sound a little strange that I would throw that one in there, but you know, doing all the way, going all the way back to slavery, the slave masters who were raping and sodomizing little black boys and little black girls justified it by saying that they wanted it, that they were highly sexed. They tried everything they could to dehumanize them and to justify their kind of uh, beastly behavior by, by saying that these children wanted it, they were highly sexed and, and, and not seeing them the way that they saw white children. So these stereotypes bring about some serious consequences. Black children are poor and on welfare. Some of them are. Black children live in single parent homes, some of them do. A disproportionate amount of them do. But you know, 50% of the marriages in America end in divorce, which means a lot of white children are living in single parent homes. But somehow, the number of white children living in single parent homes is never put forth in society as a problem that needs to be talked about. But for black children, it is. And, and I agree, it is. But why? is it never talked about amongst other children? And why do we allow that though to impact, if we are educators, how we educate black children and what our expectations are for them just based on where they live or what, what, what are their living conditions or, or arrangements, okay? So what I want you to do is think about all the negative images you see of black people on a daily basis and how does that impact your thinking and how does that impact your approach towards the education of black children? Because those negative images are impacting how you view black children and those negative images are impacting how black children view themselves. So what I want you to think about is what is your attitude? How has your attitude and expectations of black children been affected by the negative images and perceptions and stereotypes that you have inculcated in your mind? What are your academic expectations for Asian students? Because you know, stereotypes can be positive or negative. If you're an Asian student and you benefit from this positive stereotype that automatically assumes that because you're Asian, that you're smart, you're bright, you're brilliant, you're, gonna, you're good in technology, you're good in medicine and all of the, these things. So when you walk into the classroom, you may walk into the classroom being given an advantage, being uh, automatically having higher expectations expectations bestowed on you just on the strength of you being an Asian student. And let's be honest, teachers fall victim to that. So what are your ex academic expectations for Asian students? 
for Jewish students, for students with money, for white students, as opposed to what are your what's your attitude and expectations for black children? You've got to examine that. That's why I'm saying technique is not that important until you examine what's going on in your own mind when it comes to how you approach the education of black children. So black children have been victimized by the negative stereotypes, by the images, and, and they need confidence in their ability to excel academically because many of them are not excelling, not achieving at the academic level that they should be because many of them have actually lost confidence in their ability because they have inculcated such negative stereotypes and images of themselves and who they are and what they're capable of. So black children need to see positive images of black people in their classrooms. Black children should be taught about blacks who have excelled and are excelling in all areas of human activity, not just sports and medicine. That is not where we have our greatest accomplishments, sports and medicine. We are excelling in all areas of human activity and black children need to see that. Black children need to see that blacks are pioneers and leaders in medicine, science and academia and entrepreneurship and space exploration and technology and aeronautics and literature, et cetera. And if you don't know who these people are, it is incumbent upon you as an educator to do the research and find them. They're blacks, successful black businessmen and women all around you. You can go and do the research and find the successful blacks in space technology, in aeronautics and literature, et cetera, and share that with black children in all areas, okay? Because you have to teach these facts share those stories of the individuals into every aspect of your curriculum regardless of the age of your students you have to infuse this information in the math and the science and the history and the english and the literature and everything that you teach the accomplishments of blacks and in in black history should be a part of it because black children who know and understand their history and what it says about who they are will operate from a position of strength because that's what history does. It tells you who you are and what you're capable of when you realize and read what your ancestors have accomplished. And black history is being made every day. So we're not just talking about thousands of years ago when blacks built the pyramids and uh, introduced reading and writing to the world and black people introduced civilization to the world. We're talking uh, and, and medicine to the world but we're also talking about the accomplishments of blacks, right? That's happening even in 2020. History is being written every day. And so black children need to know who they are and what they're capable of. And history helps them to understand that. So you've got to put these things into the educational process some sort of way. And if you're committed to it, then you will find a way to make this possible. And you will find a way to infuse this into the educational process for black children. So I want to talk now about the seven keys because there are seven keys to developing the genius that's inherent in all black children. So the first of these seven keys is that black children have to have a spiritual and a moral foundation. And the reason they have to have a spiritual and a moral foundation is because black children are spiritual and moral people. And so for them not to operate from a spiritual and moral foundation is to take them off their axis and to really take them off that which gives them that their strength. They draw strength from the spiritual relationship they have with what we call the higher power. And I'm not talking religion, but black people have a spiritual relationship with a higher power and that should not be dismissed. Black people also and black children have a innate moral foundation or moral basis. They have a innate sense of what is right and what is wrong. And that needs to be 
cultivated and nurtured not to be looked down upon. You can't impose on black children the morality of other people. Black children have a morality that is innate and, and is common to them. And their sense of right and wrong should not be dismissed, but it should be respected. And when black children understand that there are certain things that they can do and can't do, certain things that they should do and shouldn't do, and that they have a sports, a spiritual basis for how they live their lives and a moral basis for how they live their lives that is in sync with who they are naturally. And so that becomes their foundation. But if they don't have that foundation, then they become victims to the world because the world then tries to define their spirituality or dismiss their spirituality and define their morality. And that doesn't work for black children, okay? The other thing is that black children have to experience unconditional love. One of the most dangerous things that we do is to put these conditions on our love for children. And children are so sensitive, the most sensitive people in the world, that they can sense whether you love them and they can sense whether that love is unconditional. Do you love them through the good and the bad? Do you love them no matter what they look like? Do you love them when that child comes into the classroom and he forgot to comb his hair, maybe he forgot to brush his teeth, maybe his clothes aren't iron, maybe the shoes don't match or the socks don't match or whatever the case may be? Are you going to judge him by his appearance and treat him differently as a result of that? Are you going to show him respect, him or her respect? Because I believe that children should be respected. I believe that when you show children respect, children give respect in return. I don't believe that children should be dismissed as if their voice doesn't matter, as if they can be talked to any kind of way. You talk to them the same way that you would want someone to talk to your children. You talk to them the same way that you would want someone to talk to you. Show them respect. Children need to have your support and they need to have your encouragement. Give them things to say yes to and encourage them for the positive behavior instead of always punishing them for the negative behavior. Okay? In the classroom, give them the support, give them the encouragement and the reinforcement so they will be excited about displaying the positive behavior and excited about their academic achievements and that they get the same amount of attention for their academic, academic success as they would get for their athletic success. I remember um, Dr. Kanjufu, Jawanza Kanjufu said years ago, years ago, he said, you know, you go to these schools and you've got the big trophies for the athletes. Where are the big trophies for the academic achievement? Do they receive the same support and encouragement? The other thing is that high expectations. Children rise to the level of our expectations. If you don't expect much, you don't get much. So you've got to have high expectations for black children. And that's why I said again, you cannot judge them based on these superficial things that allow you to tamper down your expectations for them, their appearance, their speech, who their mother is, who their father is, where, where their address is, where they live. Perhaps you taught their older sister or older brother and all of these things you allow now to creep into your mind and, and impact what your expectations are for the children. High expectations, children rise to the level of our expectations. Knowledge and pride in history and culture. Once again, we just talked about that at a minute ago, but just to reiterate, black children have to know their history. They, and they have to not just know it, but they have to have pride in it. And the way that they have pride in their history is that you teach them accurate history and you teach them balanced history. So you can show negative things that has occurred to black people, negative things that black people have done throughout history. But if you don't show the positive, then it's not balanced. So you can say, okay, well, here's something that black people did on a negative point of view, as a way to literally almost embarrass black children. And that may be historically accurate, but is it balanced out with the other side? So that they not, when they study their history, their history makes them stick their chest out with pride, not makes them want to hide because everything that they're being taught is about black people and their failures, showing Africa not accurately. And also when you show 
Africa, for instance, even so a lot of the poverty that exists in Africa today, you don't put it in context because there's no conversation about how did that poverty come about? Who's responsible for it? You understand? So teach the true history of black people from the time that they introduced civilization to the world right up until today. Last three, real quickly, <clears throat> or not real quickly, because I do want to explore these a little bit. I believe that the ultimate key for black children, and really for all children, but for black children to be successful, is that they must identify their gifts and their talents. They must develop those gifts and talents and then use those gifts and talents to fulfill their purpose in life. Because I believe that all children, all human beings that come into this world with a purpose, and that our children, our babies are given the gifts and the talents, which are the tools that they need in order to fulfill their purpose. You know, the, the auto mechanic, in order to fulfill his purpose of repairing your car, has to have what? The proper tools. Children have a divine purpose in life, but they have to have the proper tools. Well, the proper tools have been deposited in them, the gifts and the talents that they need to fulfill their purpose in life has been deposited in them. But you as the educator must nurture and cultivate, going back to what we said earlier, nurture and cultivate those gifts and talents so that they come to the surface that they're developed fully and exploited for the good, which is to help black children reach their full potential by fulfilling their purpose. And if you want to know something, if you listen to children, the younger they are, and watch children, the younger they are in particular, they'll show you, they'll tell you what their gifts and talents are. They'll show you what their gifts and talents are. And they will literally tell you what their purpose is by telling you what it is they want to do when they grow up. The problem is that Adults get in the way. We um, try to talk them out of it sometimes because they're thinking big. We try to guide them into other areas that we want them to go into as opposed to what they want to do. We don't give them the support and the encouragement that they need to fulfill their purpose and to develop their gifts and talents. We, our expectations for them are, are lowered so they don't see the need to exploit or develop their gifts and talents to their fullest extent. But that's very important. Lastly, the last two, goals and plans. Establish goals and plans. Because if Black children are going to be successful, they have to have a roadmap. And that's what you're developing when you develop goals and plans. You're literally developing a roadblock to take you where it is that you need to go in your personal growth and development as an individual. So the child in the classroom needs to have goals short and long long-term goals and you as the educator working with that child you should have goals and uh established for that child as well so if there is um things that you want them to achieve in the classroom then maybe you have to break it down into short and long-term goals maybe you have to help them develop a plan as to how they're going to get there how they're going to achieve the things that they're focusing on achieving but Goals and plans also teaches the children, and this is very, very important, it teaches the children to have discipline, to be disciplined, because when they establish these goals and plans, no matter how young they are, you just develop goals and plans that's relevant to their age, but they develop goals and plans and, and it teaches them the discipline because now as they exercise and follow through on those goals and their plans, they will see the rewards that comes from that and they should be rewarded for that. Lastly, I want to talk about a healthy body. As an educator working with children, we've got to put more emphasis on health and nutrition because black children will not be able to achieve if they're not healthy, mentally, spiritually, and physically. So we've got to help them understand the, the value or the importance of eating healthy diets, eating healthy food, teach them how to read the ingredients in the food, teach them how to understand the uh, consequences of eating all the junk food that they eat, etc. Help them to read the ingredients and, and help them look up. One of the things we do in the mentoring program is we have an exercise where the 
boys have to name their favorite junk foods and they make a list of their favorite junk foods and then we actually have them look up the nutritional content of the junk food so they can we have them look up and see the amount of sugar the amount of uh, artificial ingredients the amount of salt different things that's that's detrimental to their health and then we can talk about that we can talk about this disproportionate number of black children that are now uh, having diabetes and, and heart issues and high blood pressure and things that used to be reserved for adults now have trickled down uh, amongst the children. So we need to talk about them building a healthy body, being active, getting out and getting some sun, putting down the video game and going out and playing some games outside in the sun and in the fresh air, et cetera, okay? So you can go back and review these later as well, the, the seven keys. So the other thing I want to talk about is that this question, why? You know, the question all children ask, and I always wonder, do parents hear them? Do teachers hear them when children ask the question, why? Oftentimes the child is saying, I just want to understand. I just want it to be relevant to me. I want to know why. If I have to study this topic, this subject matter, I would like to know why, how is this going to impact my life? I'm not saying that I won't, if you tell me, help me to understand how it benefits me, how it impacts my life. I want to know why. If you tell a child, you've got to come in before dark, the child is saying, you know what, me and my friends, we're outside playing, it's dark, but we can see very well, we don't see a problem, so maybe you could, if you could just explain to me why. A lot, a lot of times when the child is asking why, they're not challenging you, they just want to know. So make it relevant. Part of the educational process is to make it relevant. The other thing is to challenge your students' ability to reason and to think. That means you have to talk to them, reason with them, talk to them from a position of respect, not talking down to them, but talking to them at whatever age level they are, but in their capacity to understand and to take them a little deeper than you think that they are capable of going, but challenge their ability to reason and to think to comprehend when you're working with them, are they paying attention and are they on task? In this new virtual environment that many of you are experiencing now as educators, are the children free of distractions and on task? I mean, I can't imagine what may be going on, but I can also imagine that you may have a child there that's on his laptop being virtually educated, but maybe over to his left or to his right, he's got the PlayStation on, maybe he's got the television on, maybe he's got the music on whatever the case may be, they have to get rid of those distractions and so that they're on task. It doesn't matter how they're dressed, but are they on task? When they're in the classroom, maybe they're standing up, maybe they prefer to stand up and do their work. Maybe they want to sit sideways in the desk. Maybe they, I've seen them stand on one leg. I've seen them just children, especially at young ages, you know, they just full of all this energy, but are they on task? And if they're on task, that's most important. And then the other thing is, do you, back to what we just talked about a minute ago, but just to ask this question again, do you respect your black students? And do you respect them and love them to the extent that you're going to do everything that you can to help them reach their full potential? The other thing is this, we talked again, it's very important. I think the most, one of the most important skills perhaps the most important skill that a child needs to develop and leave every school year, at the end of every school year, they've gotten better in their reading comprehension skills. Because if you aren't able to read and comprehend, then the children are dead in the water, right? Because this is, this is the information age. The 21st century is the information age. And one of the things that children have to know how to do and this is something that you have to prepare them for, and that is their ability to acquire and process information, acquire and process information. And the way that you acquire and process information is you have to have very good reading comprehension skills. And once again, we come back to this relevancy. Now, why do I say that? Because, you know, I mentioned to you that I do a lot of work in prison, and I go into the prisons, and in the prisons, it is where I have met the most voracious readers that I've ever encountered, black men that are in prison. And most people, when you ask them, well, why do you think that is? Why do you think that black men in prison 
are the most voracious readers that I've ever encountered. And of course, first answer that comes out of most people's my head or mouth is, you know, they'll say, well, because they have a lot of time on their hands. And I always say, no, that's not why. The reason why they are the most voracious readers I've ever met is because their reading material is relevant. They're reading books that matter to them. They're reading books that they are able to choose to read. The books are relevant. The books deals with their interests. It deals with their personal growth and development and, and their specific interests. So the same students that may have flunked out of the class of some of you all who are listening to me right now, you probably have students, if you've been in the system long enough, that have come through your classrooms and now they're in prison or have been in prison. And you would have been amazed that many of them are in prison reading at a level that you never thought they were capable of and reading at a rate that you never thought they were capable of, but it's all because it's relevant. They understand why they're reading it. What's the benefit? Because that's what we all want to know. Why? What's the benefit? How is this relevant to me? When I work with children in my mentoring program, which is why I put the book cover up again, I'm amazed at how many children, young men, 12 to 18 years old, raise their hand to read. Can I just, why is your hand up, young man? I'll, I just want to know if I can read the next paragraph. S several hands are going up all at once because they want to read just a paragraph in the book. And why? Because everything in that book is about them. It's relevant. It's relevant. And so therefore they're interested. And some of them are not good readers, but they're so interested in the material that they don't care how well they read it. They just want to read it. I don't have to call on them. They volunteer. Okay, so now, this is part two, and we're going to spend about 15 minutes on, on this, so we're going to move somewhat quickly to get through it. But this is, this is part two of the presentation. We talked a lot, I guess you were saying the first part, about what you can do to help black children reach their full potential. But I want you to understand that you have an enemy. There is an enemy that is at work doing everything that it can to prevent you from being successful. There is an enemy that does not want to see black children reach their full potential. That enemy are those men and women, because I don't want you to think it's some unseen, unbelievable hand at work. There are men and women whose job is to maintain the system of white supremacy. And they use the institutions that make up the American society. They, they are the tools that they use to maintain white supremacy, white supremacy. And there is no tool that is more important to them than the educational system. So America's educational system is an institution to promote white supremacy. Now, in order for that to make sense, we have to know, or you have to know, well, what is white supremacy? Now, it's a term that's thrown around a lot. You hear it a lot. They talk about the white supremacy and they talk about the people marching in, uh, what is it, Virginia and the, the people, the skinheads or Nazis or the Ku Klux Klan, and they call them white supremacists. But I really don't even call them white supremacists <clears throat> because, as you will see, white supremacy really is a system of power. So the definition of white supremacy is a racist ideology centered upon the belief and the promotion of the belief that white people are superior in certain characteristics, traits, and attributes to people of other racial backgrounds, and that therefore white people should politically, economically, and socially rule non-white people. Now you know I have to go over that again. It says that white supremacy is a racist ideology centered upon the belief. Okay, what belief? The belief that white people are superior in certain, in certain is a key word here, that white people are superior in certain characteristics, traits, and attributes to people of other racial backgrounds. So that's the belief. But what else about this definition of white supremacy? 
and the promotion of the belief. So there are people who are committed to promoting the belief because the belief doesn't promote itself. So there are people who are actively engaged in promoting the belief that white people are superior. So how do you promote the belief? You utilize the institutions that shape thought. I'll show you that in a minute. You utilize the institutions, none being more important than the educational system. You use the educational system as a means of promoting the belief that white people are superior. Superior in what? In certain characteristics, traits, and attributes to people of other racial backgrounds. And so what? Now that you are believing that you are uh, superior, now that you are promoting the belief that you are superior, why are you promoting the belief that you are superior? Because, or therefore, as it says, because we are superior, this white folks, the proponents of this system of white supremacy, because we are superior, therefore white people should politically, economically, and socially rule, rule non-white people, rule over you, dominate you, control you, rule over you because we're superior to you. And how are we going to maintain it by promoting that belief so that black people will start to believe it, so that other non-white people will start to believe it, and so that white people will start to believe it. So this system of white supremacy that exists this well-structured, well-thought-out, well-organized system of white supremacy exists to maintain political, economic, and social rule over non-white people. This is why Neely Fuller Jr., one of the greatest instructors or, or, or educators, if you will, who helped us to understand this system of white supremacy, he and Dr. Francis Press Wells, and two of the most prominent people in this field of helping us, black and white for that matter, Neely Fuller Jr. said that if you do not understand white supremacy, racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you. And that's true. Because if you don't know that this is a system that's being promoted as a way of maintaining political, economic, and social power over a social rule over non-white people. Now, how does that work? <clears throat> Or let's look at the results first of all, and then we'll talk about how it works. The results of this failed educational system has relegated black children to these sad statistics. One being that only 18% of black fourth graders are reading proficiently. That only 17% of black fourth graders are math proficient. Only 16% of black eighth graders are reading proficiently and only 13% of black eighth graders are math proficient. So if you look at this, you'll see one, the numbers are dismal. And then secondly, you'll see that the numbers don't get better the older they get, but that the numbers actually go down and they get worse. Less than 60% of black males graduate high school. Blacks make up 12% of America's population, but 40% of America's prison population. And I swear, I believe it's even higher than that. And 70% of black children are raised in single parent homes. This is the result, not of children who are intellectually inferior, but it's the result of a failed educational system. So how does white supremacy work? It works through mind control, using the three most influential institutions in the American society. Those three institutions are education, the media, and religion. These institutions are the institutions that shape thought, and this is why they are so influential. This is why they are so important to maintaining this system of white supremacy. So the bottom line is you are using the educational process to enslave the minds of black children or liberate their minds. You decide. So what I'd like for you to do, I want you to just journey with me just for five minutes perhaps. Go with me on a little ride 
into the operating mind of white supremacy where blacks are expendable. But I want you to hold on tight because the ride gets a little bumpy, okay? And then we're going to wrap this up. So in 1970, Sidney Wilhelm wrote a book, the provocative book called Who Needs the Negro? In 1993, he published an updated version. And here's what he revealed. Okay, I'm going to read this real quickly. It says that since 1950, an entirely new technology has emerged. And please pay attention to this because you're going to, it's going to tie in to the next slides that's coming up and you'll see the thinking that's going on and how white supremacy as a system is maintained and the miseducation of black children is maintained. So since 1950, an entirely new technology has emerged, the computer economy. Interesting, going all the way back to 1950, this computer economy, he said, started to emerge. And here we are now, literally doing virtual education all over the country, showing once again the power of the computer technology, the computer economy. This mode of production does not depend upon labor, said Mr. Wilhelm, and racism relegates black people as the initial victims for elimination. The rapid expansion of mechanization upon the farm and widespread application of computers have combined to eradicate blacks from empowerment, from employment, I'm sorry, such that by the mid 80s, almost half of the 8.8 .8 million black men of age held no jobs because they are either unemployed, out of the labor force, in correction facilities, or unaccounted for. If the white American no longer needed the black American labor, he might then feel free to express the racism fully or to express his racism fully, not merely to exploit the black American as in the last 300 years, but to kill him. Wow. And the fact is that in the United States economy, the labor of the black man is increasingly not needed. The reason for this is automation or as we would say now, technology. Indians were economically useful as long as Europeans wanted furs rather than land for farming. When they were no longer useful, they were destroyed. What reason have American Blacks to expect a different outcome? Just as the people of one reservation were debauched with whiskey sold by white men, so the people of the other are ravaged by drugs. White America could not dismiss the black man until the invention of machines severed its dependency upon labor. Now the economics of technology combines with white racism to make possible the Negro's total exclusion and possibly even extermination. Now, let's move on. Here's the cover of a magazine, came from 1992, Insight Magazine. And Insight Magazine decided to do a cover story on IQ. In the 80s and in the 90s, you don't hear them talk about it a lot anymore because the damage has been done. In the 80s and in the 90s, there was a lot of talk about IQ tests. Black scholars were saying that the IQ tests were biased as a way to explain why Blacks didn't do as well on the test because you can develop culturally biased tests easily. Because like I said with Jeopardy, you can make Jeopardy Afrocentric and all of a sudden the same people who you hardly ever see on Jeopardy would now be the ones winning all the money. So you can do the same thing with IQ tests. So Blacks were saying, yeah, okay, maybe whites, Blacks aren't scoring as high as whites on the IQ test because the tests are culturally biased. But a group of scholars, white scholars, if you will call them that, came together and they said that the reason that blacks didn't score as well on the IQ test is that they simply weren't as intelligent as, as white people are. So here's what they said. They said that blacks like members of all races range in intelligence from severely retarded up to the genius level. But a lower percentage of blacks than whites score as geniuses on the test. 
Yet I'm saying that we're going to develop the genius that's inherent in all black children. They're saying, no, 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 no. Furthermore, the test scores of fully half of all blacks indicate a mental capacity to perform at best skilled blue collar jobs that require no book learning as part of training. Jobs that were plentiful, say 50 years ago, but are dwindling in a globalized US economy that has exported much of its manufacturing assembly work. By contrast, only about 16% of whites score that low. So now they go on to say, but these different middle points for the two bell curves and these scholars who came together to contribute to this magazine article are the same ones who wrote the book called The Bell Curve that some of you may have heard of about some years ago. So they say these different middle points for the two bell curves explain why few Blacks, only 3%, score above 115. And yet this is the figure that IQ experts cite as the minimum level for entering a learned profession. And these are the results they use to explain why many Blacks lag in school. So it has nothing to do with racism. It has nothing to do with discrimination. It has nothing to do with miseducation. The reason Blacks lag in school, according to them, is that they simply are not intellectually capable of keeping up. And you know, to the educators that are listening, you know that many of your colleagues, if not you, but many of your colleagues hold the same thought. How did it get into their heads? that black children are just not intellectually capable of keeping up. That's why they're falling behind. Then they go on to say, intelligence does not account for every human talent, athletic ability, musical talent, creativity, memory, and people skills have little to do with intelligence. Even borderline retarded people can play an orchestra. Now, Think back to the definition of white supremacy. It said that white people are superior in certain characteristics and traits. And that's why I said the word certain is very critical because why wouldn't they say that they are superior in all characteristics and traits? But they don't claim superiority in athletic ability and in musical talent. Why? Because they say that these are talents that does not require intelligence. So we'll concede to you black people, y'all are really good in sports. You can run that football and dunk that basketball like nobody's business. And as long as you stay in your place on the football field and on the basketball court, and as long as you stay singing and dancing for the entertainment of whites, then we will give you as many opportunities as possible to do so. Why? Because you are fulfilling the theory that we have put forth that you are not our intellectual equals, that you are deficient when it comes to your intellect. And the reason you excel in athletics and in music is because those two areas does not require intelligence. That's why they said, that white people are superior in certain characteristics, traits, or attributes. But you aren't going to see blacks move up proportionally as coaches. They don't move up proportionally as general managers and as presidents and as owners because they have been told, and the belief is that, no, you, you don't have the intellect to dance in those arenas, to perform in those arenas. You're where you are. And when you achieve as much as you can on the field, you've done the best you can. This is why for a long time they wouldn't let blacks play quarterback because they said quarterback was a thinking man's position. And then when blacks started playing quarterbacks, they started shifting it from a thinking man's position to an athletic position. <laughs> you have to be skillful in watching what's going on. As soon as when blacks came into the position of quarterback, then they say in, in the professional or even major college sports, they said they are achieving based on their athletic ability. But when white quarterbacks achieve, it's because they are so intelligent. Same thing in baseball, same thing in, uh, in basketball, okay? The reason why blacks can achieve as long as they're singing and dancing, but they don't have the same level of success when it comes to 
owning record companies, when it comes to being managers and administrators and presidents and CEOs, et cetera, is because once again, that's not the area that you perform in because you would then break the stereotypes and dispel the thoughts and that we have put forth when it comes to this system of white supremacy. So you understand that they are, blacks are allowed to achieve in certain areas or in certain endeavors because it reinforces this thought that blacks are not as intelligent, okay? So let's move on to a good thing. We've got a couple of slides and then we'll wrap it up. So they went on to say that even environment ultimately stems from intelligence in their view because smart people create good environments, stupid people, bad ones. Some have suggested removing the children of not so bright mothers from their homes. Talk to many IQ researchers long enough and they will eventually suggest that the only realistic solution to the problem of unemployed, angry, violent, not so bright people is, well, to get rid of them. Not to kill them, of course, but somehow to persuade them not to reproduce or not to reproduce so much while high IQ people reproduce so little. Now, who are the high IQ people? Because you've already said that Blacks are the low IQ people, IQ people. So what you're saying is you've got to persuade Blacks not to reproduce so much while whites reproduce so little because whites are the high IQ people, right? And so now, how are you going to do that? They say, well, maybe with contraceptives, maybe with cash. What are you going to pay them not to have children? Are you, are you going to make sure through the use of contraceptives that they cannot reproduce? Well, as they said, eugenics isn't a crime. Eugenics, well, what is eugenics? It is the study of or belief in the possibility of improving the qualities of the human species or a human population, especially by such means as discouraging reproduction by persons having genetic defects or presumed to have inheritable, undesirable traits. That would be negative eugenics. Or encouraging reproduction by persons presumed to have inheritable, desirable traits. That would be positive eugenics. But remember, eugenics isn't a crime. So employing these tactics is okay because we've got to persuade these dumb people, these stupid people from having babies. And who was at the forefront of that? was a woman named Margaret Sanger, who is one of the founders of Planned Parenthood, and she is one of the pioneers of eugenics. I don't know how many people know that Planned, Planned Parenthood, excuse me, was founded by a woman who was hell-bent on the practice of eugenics, of stopping the reproduction of Black people. So now you have to say, well, what really is the agenda of Planned Parenthood. So now, are you willing, having digested that, are you willing to help black children reach their full potential? Knowing that there's an enemy, well-organized, orchestrated, powerful enemy working to keep black children from reaching their full potential? Are you willing to work just as hard to help black children reach their full potential? I'm going to assume that you are. I'm going to assume that the fact that you took time to view this presentation says that you are concerned with the future of black children. However, your concern must be put into action. Black children are not expendable. If they die, we die. And when children are miseducated and not properly nurtured so that they can reach their full potential, it is in many ways a death sentence. The children die from the inside out because their natural growth and development has been cut off. Their internal dying is manifested in the bad decisions and the destructive behavior 
that these children engage in at home, in the classroom, and in the streets. If we embrace our children with love and devotion, they will embrace themselves with love and devotion. They will say yes to life, and they will engage in positive behavior, not destructive behavior. They will embrace school and the educational process because they are born with an innate desire for knowledge and wisdom. The responsibility is on us. So I ask you once again, are you willing? Lastly, I just want to share with you some contact information. I actually have two websites. One is called Hattieschild.com, named in honor of my mother, Hattieschild.com. And that's where you find information on our educational services and mentoring programs. If you want to purchase the book, if you want to uh, arrange a speaking engagement or a presentation, all of that information is available on Hattieschild.com. Protective Hands Communications is really where we focus more on our book publishing and communication uh, work. But you can reach me through either website or you can reach me through uh, the phone number provided as well. I actually really, really look forward to hearing from you and I'm honored to have had this opportunity to take up some of your time that you would give me some of your time. I greatly appreciate it. And I, I hope that something has been shared with you that will increase your commitment your motivation your desire to see black children reach their full potential thank you peace and blessings to you all